there is palpable tension, apprehension, and misgivings in the Progressive Governors Forum, PGF, of the ruling All Progressives Congress, the APC, over the choice of a consensus national chairman. There were also indications last night that the leadership of the party had begun to consider March for a possible new date for its national convention, earlier slated for Saturday, February 26th. This latest development has split governors elected under the political party into three different groups. While the group of second-term governors want the convention to hold as planned and were assiduously working towards settling for a candidate, the second group, which is made up of mostly first-term governors, want the convention either postponed and a mechanism to return the Governor May Malabuni-led caretaker-slash-extraordinary convention planning committee designed so that Buni can continue. On the other hand, a third group of governors also want the convention to hold and for Buni to continue or the convention postponed. Meanwhile, Malam Saliu Mustafa, a front runner for the chairmanship position, says that the February 26th date remained sacrosanct. Well, this is all completely dizzying, and one can barely make head or tail of the different you know, schools of thought that have emerged around this convention, whether it's holding on Saturday or not. I mean, APC has already notified INEC of their intention to hold a convention this Saturday, but of course that's not binding. That doesn't stop a postponement happening, if at all it comes to that, if this speculation is correct. We were told that there was a meeting between some governors and the president before the president um, went on his uh, most recent trip. But nothing has really been disclosed from that meeting in terms of concrete details. It does look somewhat messy that the APC cannot seem to get its act together for this long-awaited convention. And any further postponement only does create the impression of a party in disarray. Okay. Well, I mean, this is... Uh to be expected. When the APC was coupled together in uh, 2014, there were many tendencies coming together uh, for one purpose, to get the PDP out of power and to replace uh, the then president at the center and put their own person there. Okay, that, that's what uh, you know, politicians do, don't, isn't it? They look for power. And we have seen many examples of uh, coalitions uh, in different parts of uh, Africa just for the purpose of getting to office. But it would seem that, uh, you know, down the line, uh, after two terms of the APC government, those disparate entities, those groups, divisions, each is asserting uh, itself. As we move towards 2023, you have the ACN wing, and it's not as if the ACN wing itself is uh, together. You have the, uh, uh, the uh, CPC wing of HCPC, AMPP, a wing of the party. It's not as if they themselves are speaking with one voice. And then you have the other, you know, equal joiners, equal founders uh, who were part of that uh, group. The only one that we've not been hearing uh, from uh, prominently, maybe because they pulled out of the party, was the new PDP at that time that was part of that uh, coalition. Now, obviously, you know, 2023 is very important to all political parties, particularly the major political parties. But you recall that the APC has been going from one crisis to the other, from uh, Uyegun to former governor Ushiomole of uh, Edo State, and all of those issues are still right there on the table. And I think that the chickens are coming home to roost. But if we were to talk to a, an APC member, the standard response would be, oh, there are no factions in the party. Uh, it is a family affair, and that everyone will be uh, surprised uh, that the matter will, resolve, will be resolved. But we know that it's not uh, necessarily a family affair. But if you break it down in terms of the details uh, that they are quarreling over, one, the May Malabuni is now an ordinary convention committee. There, were persons who believe, there are persons in that party who believe that May Malabuni holding on to that position is something in their view that is unconstitutional and illegal, and there have been threats of uh, lawsuits. Okay, but he has managed to survive as the person to sustain the convention. And then you find that some people are even saying that after the convention, Mima Labuni should remain uh, to organize the presidential primaries. Some of them are saying, oh, both the presidential primaries and the convention should go together. So this is power play within uh, the party. The second issue uh, that is dividing the party, as is the case also in the opposite uh, uh, 
a major party. Is zoning. Where should be chairmanship of the party be zoned to? The speculation is that party leaders are thinking of, you know, uh, zoning the chairmanship of the party to the North Central. But at the same time, you have 12, you know, aspirants for the position of the chairman of the uh, APC. That in itself is a source of tension because once the zoning is done, it could then affect some other, you know, details that will be worked out at the uh, convention. The third issue, of course, is the quarrel over consensus. Some members of the party think uh, that the consensus option should be adopted in choosing who the uh, chairman of the party uh, should be, and there is no agreement on that. Now, the president was approached, we were told, you know, uh, to be the decider, to give direction as to, you know, what he thinks about where the chairmanship should go. And we're told that before the president traveled, all he did was to ask for the list of the 12 uh, aspirants and that no decision was taken. And if any decision was taken, uh, that is not yet in the public domain. You can assume that maybe, you know, the needle will not move in any direction until the president returns from the uh, EU-AU uh, summit, which he has, he has gone to uh, attend. But I think what is important is that the uh, APC, should learn from the lessons of history. This was how the PDP was divided among its ranks in 2014. And it, the party paid dearly for it because it was very easy for the opposition uh, to just, you know, uh, wrong foot the PDP and the PDP lost power at the center. And it's unfortunate that the APC has been going from one crisis to the other in terms of the, you know, factionalization of the party. As I said again, many members of the party will say there's no uh, faction, but clearly there is. But I hope that they will be able to resolve their problems and abide by the principles of internal democracy. We keep talking about this all the time. Uh, political parties within a democratic system uh, cannot be, uh, you know, advertising tendencies uh, that may seem undemocratic or that may see that seem as if certain persons, you know, want to dominate others within the party. But I think, you know, we just keep watching and we see how the uh, drama plays out at the end of the day. And we're concerned about the APC and the PDP because they are the major political parties. The other political parties may not have this kind of intense internal rivalry, you know, among uh, their ranks. Well, even President Buhari did warn that a divided house might not stand. That's all on the news headlines. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Rosa Sajiri, Michael Wilson, Adeswa Omoran, and Aaron Akirjala to give us updates on Africa and global business, COVID-19, and sporting activities across the globe. Stay with us. Welcome back to Morning Show here on Arise News. For a global business update, Michael Wilson joins us now from South Africa. I see you're still yeah. there. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. This is, I, I'm in Cape Town as we speak. Um, and a very good morning to you all and both of you too as well. Um, right, first of all then, let's take a look at Asia stocks and what's really happening on the, on, on the border between Ukraine and Russia depends which news outlets you actually want to believe. Some people say troops are being withdrawn, some people saying they aren't. Um, the United States is saying that nothing's changed. However, the markets, as we were discussing yesterday, really uh, heard what they wanted to hear and, and gained a little, although futures slightly shaky this morning, but I'll come on to that. As far as uh, Asia-Pacific stocks are concerned, all fairly mixed, as you'd imagine, because people are trying to work out what everybody else in the world is trying to work out at the moment. Japan's exports uh, actually came in far below expectations. Mainland Chinese stocks up very, very slightly. Um, Singapore um, actually doing rather well, growth there doing extremely well uh, and much higher than expectations. Um, it expanded, the economy expanded there um, more around about, they're looking about between three and five percent this year, which given, given the size of the economy, the importance to the area and also the way it's grown over the past few years is actually quite big um, for them. Um, shares in Australia up as well as a result of their employment um, situation getting much better. Global investors, let's turn to them, and they're looking at China particularly, despite all the regulations and so on. They're looking at Chinese stocks and thinking to themselves, these are a good investment. It's very, very positive indeed. But 
I think that the important thing about this, yes, they are gobbling up China stocks. They're also, though, interested in India as well, and that's slightly overtaking uh, China uh, in terms of a destination for foreign direct investment. Uh, China itself is adding through its, um, its off-10 uh, government um, organization and regulator, it's adding a number of countries, co companies to those who want to go into the metaverse. Um, and there's, there's quite a few of them, We're looking at now 17. Um, it's, it's the state fact, it's called the China Mobile Communication Association. I only quote that big name for you, rather complicated one, because we're going to be hearing a lot more about that as various companies, as we've been saying all week, are wondering whether to do an IPO uh, in China or whether to go abroad. Um, NVIDIA, let's talk about that, um, it, it, the American multinational technology company. D uh, data sales up 7.1%. I quote that figure merely because it shows that there's a lot of confidence in the way that chips are going. If there's a lot of confidence in the way that chips are going, it means a lot of confidence in the global economy. As far as the United States is concerned, I did say that futures have dropped down very, very slightly indeed. But the Dow had a relatively good day. Again, were we looking at what we wanted to hear or were we actually looking at what's going on? Because we don't really know what's going on. Um, Cisco is worth worth note, uh, the switching gear company. Uh, they are up, um, shares up as much as uh, 6% on a very, very healthy uh, quarter um, for them. The S&P 500 uh, closed little change, the Dow down 55 uh, sorry, ahead nearly 55 points yesterday. So relative optimism, but not an enormous amount. Now, those all important Fed minutes yesterday, what did they tell us? Well, not a great deal that we don't know already. I thought, have to say, having looked at them, they're relatively hawkish. The market disagreed completely, and that's why there wasn't a big drop. And what they're saying is um, we, we, we're not going to run before we can uh, actually walk. I think that's the bottom line. Google. Let's turn to them planning privacy laws, which uh, uh, which will monitor the, the use of information that they're getting from their users. Now, in the past, when this has happened between these mega giants, uh, the mega tech companies, um, it's actually hit the rivals hit their rivals quite bad, as Apple did with Facebook. And so, and we'll see how this actually settles down. But there are big, big changes there. Um, the UK is going to scrap its what it's described as its golden visa rules. If you have more than two million pounds, which you can guarantee is going to be a in the UK economy, then your visa was speeded up. The downside of that is that uh, many people are saying that that allowed uh, Russians, amongst other uh, people, to launder illicit money through the city of London. So they're tightening uh, on that. A Home Office report has seen a, a significant volume of Russian and Russia-linked illicit finance, um, £5 billion into the property market. That's not an enormous amount, but it, it, there, there's the figure, £5 billion, that's what they've identified. But it also goes down to things like school fees and and, and a luxury apartment rentals and the rest of it. Nick Clegg, former UK Deputy Prime Minister, um, he's on a parallel now with Mark Zuckerberg at Meta, or used to be called uh, Facebook. Again, the reason for mentioning this is he's a politician who moved into the commercial sector, but because his major role is going to be regulatory, it does show the way in which Facebook is actually planning for the future, recognising quite well that it is going to come under um, quite a big regulatory uh, cosh, um, as it's doing at the moment and will continue to do through 2022. Oil, as you know, has enjoyed quite a wild ride. Uh, yesterday, on the news that Iran's top negotiator has said there was some sort of settlement looming, as far as those talks are concerned, the price went off. Um, the market's saying that really it didn't have the energy to get to go above $100 um, a barrel. Well, well, we'll see about that. But what it does is, the byproduct of all this is, and I have been saying this for some time, is that the more expensive the oil price gets, then alternative uh, energy and alternative extraction methods become more profitable. And the, U the US is facing that as far as its shale industry is concerned. Now, wouldn't that be amazing if that turned into it, it being a long-term major oil producer, the largest oil producer uh, in the world? And finally, gold is rebounding on the uncertainty is becoming uh, attractive again. It's been languishing over the past couple of months, but as more worries increase, then its attractiveness as a safe haven increases too. That's the global view this morning. Well, congratulations to Nick Clegg with that really fancy job title that must look very impressive on business cards. But it does show that obviously his um, experience as former deputy prime minister of the UK is coming in handy with regards to policy. And I wanted to discuss this with you yesterday with, you know, 
regarding China and their tech clampdown and now this news about Google. What exactly is happening? You will, well, we all know that data collection is the lifeblood of all these tech giants and Facebook has relied hugely, well, now Meta has relied hugely on this. How can Facebook now pivot? Because they're going to have to, aren't they? Since, you know, data collection is being more and more regulated. I, I, I'm not sure what experience being the UK Deputy Prime Minister uh, and leader of the Liberal Democrats actually brings to Facebook, but let's leave that aside for the people. Presumably, rub shelves with politicians and understands politics speak. That's exactly um, as far it. as <laughs> as as far as the more commercial uh, aspects are concerned, you're absolutely right. Data is the new money, uh, is the new finance, and that that's what all these companies are beginning to realise. And as I've been pointing out, we've discussed in the past on this program. You know, at the time of Facebook and Google and the likes of it being these kind of little players, you know, within but it's a sort of social media. It's completely different now. They, they are in charge of a huge amount of information. Not only that, they are in charge of the way in which a lot of us get our news, for example. And so there are lots of regulatory hurdles which they, they will have to cross, lots of ex expenses that they will have to deal out to, to media operations that have to spend the money towards these companies which merely aggregate the news. There are all sorts of things going on. So I think, I think that the bottom line about Nick Clegg um, it is that, you know, it, it shows how much Mark Zuckerberg realises this, this regulatory uh, impact uh, is, is going to have on a company. It's going to be absolutely massive. As far as China's concerned, so it's all mixed messages as usual, isn't it? We've got some of them, some people, and there's some of them clamping, some of the authorities there clamping down on IPOs and deciding which which companies can actually attract foreign investors or not. Um, I still think that the jury's out on it. I mean, it, the developments... The developments happen every day, and certainly with these new 17 companies uh, being looked at as far as metaverse um, the regulations are concerned, it's clear that they that they know what's going on. It's a question of how they manipulate their, 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 their companies to be within a regulatory framework, but also allows these companies to get its hands on, on capital too. It, it's a very, very mixed picture. We pick it apart every day, don't we? I mean, that's even for the less. Okay, Michael, the uh, UK planning to scrap uh, the golden visa, and we expect that an announcement will be made uh, next week. Uh, isn't this uh, counterproductive, particularly as you look at it, that this is not really about investment or wealth creation. This seems to be more about politics. In 2020, Parliament uh, resolved uh, that uh, there is a growing uh, Russian influence uh, in the UK, particularly in the financial and property uh, uh, markets. But it's not only Russians that invest, uh, bring this uh, two uh, million pounds uh, to the UK. Others do also. Uh, but this uh, talk about oh, reducing Russian influence and as a result of that stopping uh, this uh, golden visa. Is it really politics that we're dealing with here? Considering the fact that the courts in the UK, they have asset, they apply sometimes assets uh, freezing orders. They have uh, uh, rules uh, in terms of unexplained wealth. Uh, in the UK. What do you think? What are we dealing with here? Politics? Russia? Because Russia is in the news uh, over Ukraine? I, I think this, there's been an enormous amount of pressure for all the reasons you just, you just mentioned, that the, the, their attention is now turning towards this. What, why has it not happened in the past? This is nothing new. Um, this is absolutely about politics. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that that's how we should regard it as well, whether it actually stops the money coming in. I mean, this is always the problem, isn't it? You know, what, so, for example, that do public schools in this country, um, or rather the, the private schools, you know, the, the big ones, the, the universities with, with their China connections and so on, do they just stop all that because of, because of politics? Or they, do they continue to, get, to take the money because they actually need it? I mean, if you really want to get down to it, I suppose we'd be looking at overseas student fees as well, wouldn't we? Um, it's, it doesn't compare with, I'm not talking about anything illicit here, just talking about the way that money comes into a country. Um, the, ev everything that, that, that the authorities are now looking at at the moment is, uh, is, is a guess, I suppose, whether, the, whether or not the money comes from, um, from illicit, illicit games or not. Uh, what they're saying is, and I, this is a vote, please, so there's no question about it, um, that they are going to look at more applicants who are going above that two million pound threshold and saying, all right, so where's your money actually from? I mean, you have to take their word for it, don't you? It's, it's difficult. This is, this is all about international um, financial and political relations. 
Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Our dependable Rosa Sadiri is here to give us African business update. Good morning. Good morning, Tundu. Good morning, uh, Doctor. Good morning to all our viewers. Uh, we kick off with uh, tech news. Uh, it's a shame Rafai is not here. I've been really excited about this. Uh, Flutterwave hitting a $3 billion valuation based on Series D funding, where they raised an additional $250 million. And um, look, this is, uh, again, you know, this is a, a company that is making payments connectivity um, possible. And uh, essentially, look, for anyone who's wondering, you know, how is it that this company is raising all this money? How is it that they're worth a whopping $3 billion? Africa's um, payments potential is what is behind this. So in these, in these um, funding rounds, uh, Tundu, you could be an investor, doctor. This room we're sitting in could be a, a, a private meeting where a funding round could take place. I will hand you a pitch deck. The pitch deck contains... Uh, pretty much the information on the company, what they're planning on doing, their financials. And they flip through the page deck and they say, wow, Flutterwave has done, what, 200 million transactions worth $16 billion. Every time you connect to your computer to make a purchase, you have options now that pop up for you to make a secure payment. Flutterwave pops up. Paystack pops up. Your bank pops up. You can make a payment with USSD or make a payment with your debit card. And what they're doing is to continue to expand the payment connectivity um, uh, uh, structure or space to allow these payments to go through. And it is the fact that they've processed so many transactions and they're planning on expanding into more countries. Investors are saying, okay, we'll put some more money, take a stake in your company. And that's why you continue to see the valuation increase. But the entire, the, the, the payment infrastructure for Africa, I mean, fintechs are in that, in this space. The banks are in this space, the telcos are in this space, and it's, um, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty huge uh, with respect to what could, uh, what could take place uh, in the future. So, so good on them. That's a space that needs to be exploited. Um, to agriculture, Dr. Abubakar, who is the Minister of, uh, of Agriculture and Rural Development, Doctor, your favorite ministry, <laughs> they, <laughs> they've, uh, they've inaugurated uh, soil testing labs uh, in Abuja. Um, I think it's called the GIS, Geographic Information Systems. And they've got this fancy thing called, is it Metro, Metroscophop? So there's an infrared, there's an infrared system that's supposed to test the, you know, do like, you know, analytics of soil to make sure that they're fertile. Um, the Minister Abubakar did say um, that the reason behind Nigeria's um, um, lack of um, yield on soil is because of the lack of the low for soil fertility. I don't know if you remember this last year, June, July 2021, during Salami and the Presidential Economic Advisory Council made a presentation to President Buhari where they told him that only about 2, 2.5% of, uh, of arable land is, you know, uh, good enough to develop crops. And then the president at the time said, oh gosh, I didn't know that. We have to do something about it. So, this is part of uh, what they're doing. There's a, um, uh, you know, look, there's a, there's a climate change department. There's a national agricultural technology initiative where they're supposed to be making sure they check that, you know, inclement weather, you know, um, climate change impacts, drought, and so on and so forth, uh, doesn't impact soil. So, but, the, but the main thing here is that, and these, so, these labs are in Abuja. So they are being, you know, inaugurated in Abuja, and they're supposed to make sure that they can improve yield uh, on soil so that you can... Um, and grow more crops. Part of the, you know, you know how President Buhari feels about uh, about agriculture. And then to Namibia, Namibia has raised its benchmark interest rate. The Bank of Namibia, the central bank, um, four percent, first time in six years. They eased their interest rates um, over the last couple of years as a result of COVID nineteen. Try to you know boost aggregate demand and so on and so forth. But they hiked it now. This rate hike was in line with South Africa. South Africa raised their benchmark rates uh, about a couple of weeks ago. The Namibian dollar is pegged to the South African rand. When Namibia got their independence from South Africa back in 1993, they stopped using the rand and went to the Namibian dollar. But until till today, the rand is still very much used in, in Namibia. Namibia, of course, South Africa is their big neighbor uh, down south. All their trading is linked to them. But it's a very interesting experiment. They've got a common monetary area with Namibia, South Africa, Lesotho, and I think Eswatini, where they're all 
linked for trading purposes and so on and so forth. So whenever I think about Namibia, I think about the whole talk around whether or not we should have um, a unified African currency to allow trade because the South African rand is a free floating currency. It goes up and down with uh, market metrics. And so when the currency strengthens, the Namibian dollar strengthens. When it weakens, the Namibian uh, dollar weakens as well. So I think earlier on, was, about, was it earlier this year or last year, excuse me, they said that they would keep that peg um, alive. But that's what we're seeing. The inflation, by the way, I think is 4.6% uh, in Namibia. So that hike was also in line with that as well. Well, thank you, Rotus. It was really interesting that Flutterwave thanked their regulators, which is really <laughs> politic of them, obviously, but it does make practical sense. You can be as innovative as you like. If you're in a hostile regulatory environment, that's you and your innovation completely stifled. Right. And I've been watching this um, trending series at the moment about a fraudster. Yeah. Never mind the fact that, yeah, she, was, she lied and committed fraud and ended up in jail and what have you. It's made me really appreciate the kind of passion, the effort that goes into startups, Ooh. the difficulties in attracting investment, and just how hard what Flutterwave has achieved oh, yeah. really was, how difficult it was, and just how inspiring it all truly is. I have a renewed appreciation yeah. for that whole process. Right. And about soil, soil fertility, great. That's just one of many factors that causes low yield. So I'm glad that tech has been applied in that regard. But what about insecurity? That is a huge one. We have um, data from the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics recently that our wheat production in Nigeria has plummeted by 89% mm. because of insecurity. Right. And there's also pests and diseases. So Soil fertility and analysis of that, that's all very well and good. But insecurity, getting the farmers to the farms, that's really quite you know, crucial. Because if you think about this, excellent point. Some folks are like, well, why is the government inaugurating soil testing um, labs? Private sector could. If three of us are farmers and we want to go farm, we would want to test the soil to make sure that the crops that we want to grow will work. So we would bring in our own labs to do that. So the private sector could very well take care of this. But boom, insecurity. That's... That's the hindrance for them wanting to do what the government is doing. Yeah. Okay. We're told that uh, Nigeria is trying to do soil test uh, survey, a mapping of uh, soil fertility across the country. Mm. And it's very strange that for an administration or successive governments that have been talking about agriculture becoming the mainstay of the economy, that is just in 2022 know, exactly. that we're just talking about soil fertility. Right. Now, the soil testing laboratories, the uh, equipment you were trying to... Uh, Referred to is infrared spectral photometer. Thank you, sir. They call it <laughs> oh, that is soil fertility and GIS and yeah. all of that. Now we have four ma major laboratories now: Kaduna, Ibadan, Umudike, and now this one in Abuja. And the question that comes to mind is: How many farmers are in Ibadan? How many farmers are in Kaduna Metropolis? Mm. How many are in uh, Umudike? Right? Okay. So are the uh, farmers themselves even aware that these laboratories? exist right so that's the question the main persons the main persons that we use this particular facility are the farmers right or the farming units that we have yeah. okay so this should not become a fancy project that is put in state capitals right where even if farmers are supposed to access them they will bear additional cost and we hope that enough has been done uh, to sensitize farmers about the need for checking soil fertility even if farmers you know, as you said, they know it's a responsibility that they must take on uh, on their own. It's not just enough to put fertilizer. Mm. You have to uh, study the yield that's available. So why this, in a sense, uh, is a good idea, soil fertility, soil testing, it should not end up as a, an opportunity for, you know, the Ministry of Agriculture, Federal Ministry of Agriculture, to award contracts. Right. To set up laboratories that will be of no use, uh, you know, to the target audience. And uh, you will hear about uh, spectral photometers, you know, being imported for billions of, uh, right. of uh, money. So that part of it is very important. Accountability is important. As for Flutterwave, yes, congratulations. Uh, this shows uh, great confidence in the efforts of, uh, you know, those fintech guys who started this uh, uh, particular technology-driven uh, transformational payment system in 2016. And it also shows endorsement you know, by the international community. Some of those uh, bodies that were named, you know, if they didn't have confidence in right. Flutterwave, they will not put their money uh, in it. Third, one of the things that was said in the press release that, uh, that was published 
under the name uh, Benga Bola, which was the lead, uh, who is the lead uh, innovator. Yep. You know, he referred to government policy. Mm. CBN of Nigeria under Godwin MFLA, creating the opportunity for companies like Flutterwave to emerge. Yeah. But oftentimes, with regard to the regulatory environment, we have contradictions. You know, and government must see this, you know, as part of the need to be more consistent in supporting those fintech companies that promote financial inclusion. And I, I think uh, Flutterwave's achievement uh, is also uh, some kind of pride, not just to Nigeria, but also Africa, Indeed. you know, because Flutterwave has become one of the, um, you know, best unicorns, you know, in Africa at the moment. And, uh, most valuable. Well, yeah. yes, <laughs> what we can do at Africa, $3 yeah. billion. Yep. Uh, exactly. dollars. What we can just say to Agbola and his team is that, you know, this, again, should be a confidence booster uh, for them to keep their eyes on the ball mm. and to remain uh, committed. Yep. Thank you very much, Rotus. Thank you, Thank you. Rotus. Now for an update on the COVID-19 pandemic, Adeswa Omora is here with us. Good morning, Adeswa. Good morning, Tundu, and good morning, Dr. Abati. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we now know that in the last seven days, there were little above 16 million new COVID-19 infections and 75,000 deaths globally, according to the WHO Weekly Report. And that's a 19% uh, decline in infections uh, while deaths remain stable. Now, out of the six WHO regions of the world, the Western Pacific was the only region that saw a spike in cases. They saw 19% in that region. While the biggest drop, however, came in from Southeast Asia, they saw a 37% decline in cases. The number of deaths, however, rose by 38% in the Middle East and by one-third in the Western Pacific. Country-wise, Russia saw the biggest numbers of infections for the last seven days. The WHO says other coronavirus variants such as the Alpha, the Beta, and the Delta continue to decline globally, while the Omicron variant uh, crowds them out. What did we see here in Nigeria in the last 24 hours, where we saw only 13 new infections, and again, no COVID-19-related deaths in the country? A look at the vaccination update against uh, coronavirus in Nigeria. Well, we do know that Nigeria uh, missed a target to vaccinate 50% of its eligible population by month end for last month, January 31st to be precise. Uh, the NPHCDA, however, yesterday said all five states in the southeastern region of Nigeria remain in the league of the 10 low performing states. Others that make up the, the top 10 sports are Edo, Borono, Sokoto, and Bayosa State, while the top five performing states are Nasarawa, Jigawa, Ogun, Kwara, and Kwara State, as well as the Federal Capital Territory. So that's the outlook at the moment. Well, speaking of vaccines, an internal WHO document seen by Reuters news agency shows that the relatively short life of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine is complicating the rollout of vaccines to the world's poorest countries, including here in Africa. Most of the 19 states or 19 nations in Africa listed in that document shows that they had a very large proportion of AstraZeneca vaccines that were expired. Uh, compared to a handful of other uh, countries with expired doses of other manufacturers. For instance, uh, of the total expired doses declared by those countries, uh, there were about 1.3 million AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccines. Meanwhile, there were 280,000 Johnson & Johnson, 15,000 Moderna, and 13,000 Russia Sputnik V vaccine. But let me quickly add, because it is important to say this, that this does not mean that the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine is inferior. What it means is that it, compared to others, it has a shorter life. And because they abundantly arrive to these poor countries in very short, limited time for them to be used up, uh, they become wasted. And so that's why there's an attention on the AstraZeneca vaccine. It is not inferior. Meanwhile, yesterday, the German firm BioNTech announced plans to ship mobile COVID-19 production units to Africa. The lab uh, in containers is dubbed, guess what, BioNTainer. Very 
very interesting. Well, BioNTech could be shipped to several countries, and the company says it could churn up up to 50 million doses of vaccines in a year. That's a lot. At the moment, BioNTech is considering Rwanda and or Senegal. Yes, Dr. Abati Nigeria is again not in the picture. Well, President Paul Kagame of Rwanda, his counterparts in Senegal, uh, Makisal and Nana Kufuado of Ghana were all present at the production site in Marburg, Germany yesterday. Alongside was the WHO Director General, Dr. Thredos Gabriosis. They all welcomed this development by BioNTech. And away from that, hospitals and testing facilities in Hong Kong are now buckling under pressure. Tundu, you, you talked about this uh, some days ago. They are seeing the worst COVID-19 outbreak ever since the pandemic began in Hong Kong. And there are reports of bed spaces now filled and people are now being treated in open spaces out of hospitals. And there's a lot of pressure coming in from China as the president, Xi Jinping, yesterday sent a rear but very direct message to the leader, Carrie Lam, yesterday, saying that leaders need to take uh, responsibility and all necessary measures to control the outbreak must be taken. Finally, in Zanzibar, Tanzania, passengers arriving uh, at its international airport are now being tested using a scanner instead of having to provide nose or mouth swabs. Well, I've never heard of any COVID-19 test that doesn't require a swab either the monocular ones or the rapid antigen test. But here in Tanzania, all they're doing now is a scanner. We do hear this was um, as a result of a research conducted by the Abu Dhabi government, and it cost about, let me get that figure, $1 billion. Back to you guys. I am also interested in this um, $1 billion research because I thought COVID was tested, <laughs> as you said, by droplets. A scanner suggests maybe you check a temperature. That's what I'm used to with a scanner. And that's not enough to indicate COVID-19. I'm really extremely curious about what this is about. And obviously, if there's any you know, trust that we can have in the results, then I'll be hoping that the Nigerian government can invest in a few of these scanners. But regarding Hong Kong, what a complete disaster. I mean, it's part of the government policy to refer all positive cases, no matter what the severity is, to the hospitals. And that is causing a problem where they now have to have makeshift camps outside hospitals, like we saw right at the beginning of the pandemic. The whole world has moved on beyond that point, And Hong Kong is still dealing with this. And there's been a lot of criticism about Hong Kong trying to ape China's zero COVID policy, whereas maybe another mm -hmm. strategy would have suited them better. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Can Hong Kong realistically, because here we go again, conflating the science with politics. Can Hong Kong realistically, politically, pragmatically try and defer too much from China, given the political relationship between the two? Since um, Xi Jinping has talked about him, well, hinted at a preference towards zero COVID policy for Hong Kong, does Carrie Lam dare do any different, really? Well, I won't be surprised if this is the next step Carrie Lam, uh, you know, explores, Tundu, because despite the surging numbers, uh, her government has said they would not go the way of citywide lockdown. So the only difference we have not, we, we have, we're yet to see in the playbook of China and Hong Kong at the moment is citywide lockdown. So in China, when we do have those outbreaks, they close down entire cities of millions of people just because of, of a few cases. However, in Hong Kong, they're not doing that. And we do know that the Omicron variant is highly transmissible. Of the 400,000 uh, genomic sequences that were done in the last seven days across the world, 98% of them were the Omicron variant. So, uh, some scientists have suggested that should Hong Kong wants, want to put this under control, it might have to copy that playbook uh, from beginning to end. And that includes closing down city uh, lockdowns, or lockdowns of cities because of these cases. So uh, that might be coming up in, in a couple of days now that the president of China is putting pressure on Hong Kong. Tundum, fingers well, crossed. Well, Xi Jinping, uh, speaking through the deputy uh, premier, uh, was not just putting pressure. Uh, it was made clear that the uh, Communist Party uh, is really concerned about what is going on in Hong Kong, where you also have a zero COVID uh, policy, which operates in terms of prompt response uh, when a particular area is uh, affected. Although that zero COVID policy is heavily criticized uh, in the Western press, but Hong Kong and China insist that that is the best way to go. 
Now, what has happened in uh, Hong Kong is that uh, in the last two weeks or so, we've been having about 2,000 cases per day. All the hospitals are overstretched. No beds are available. People are being treated outside uh, Caritas Hospital, you know, uh, in uh, tents, under tents and all of that. And they're running short in terms of supplies and uh, facilities. Now, uh, China is saying that, yes, okay, we're concerned. We're, we're going to support you, you know, with medical supplies, with personnel uh, to be able to address the situation. Kare Lam's administration is being blamed by, you know, the people for all of this. They say that the government of uh, Hong Kong lacks organizational skill, and that is where, why there is this uh, chaos. And the comparison is usually made with Singapore. Singapore with 5.7 million uh, population, also affected by the Omicron rate, 84% uh, uh, vaccination rate. Hong Kong has 64% uh, vaccination rate. But in Singapore, you know, they have a much better uh, situation than you have in uh, Hong Kong. Now, as for uh, BioNTech and Pfizer, you know, saying they want to do fill and finish in uh, South Africa. Well, this is not the first time they're talking about it. They wanted to collaborate with BioVac. But the concern is that BioNTech has been advised to suspend its uh, patents, but it, it doesn't want to go that route. So this is a way of circumventing you know, all that uh, request uh, for intellectual property uh, waiver. So and you find that with Big Pharma you know, doing that because of this emphasis on profit, on holding on to their intellectual property. So this is another fill and finish thing. We already have that in uh, South Africa uh, with Johnson & Johnson, which was the first fill and finish program with Aspen, you know, in South Africa. So this looks like another effort in that direction. But the more important thing will be for African countries to generate, to begin to manufacture their own vaccines. As we saw with African bio biologics using Moderna data uh, to produce, you know, by towards the end of this year, uh, first fully manufactured vaccine in Africa. And also you have similar efforts in Algeria and uh, Morocco. So those, I think, uh, are the issues. As for the uh, rapid test uh, in uh, Zanzibar, well, all of that is in collaboration with uh, the Emirate of uh, Abu Dhabi, you know, and they say it works. They say it's efficient, but they've just started testing it. And Zanzibar has uh, almost no case of, uh, you know, COVID since uh, January. So let's see uh, whether this rapid antigen test works. Because if you do PCR or, you know, at the airport, you get detained for hours. So I guess this is also a way of uh, promoting travel and tourism uh, towards uh, Zanzibar, whose major uh, mainstay is uh, travel and tourism. Thank you very much, Adis.